the, 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 the possibilities of the human body it's are unbelievable. unbelievable. It really is. Good, oh yeah, right. let's start. Dear doctor, yes. welcome back to the program. Thank you very much. It's good to be back. Yes. Uh, when you have been here with your wife, of course, yes. um, the story of your lives were so interesting. Thank you. That we didn't have too much time to discuss about your you know, life and uh, your passion for helping healthy babies certainly, come, certainly. come to life. Uh, so we'll dedicate uh, our time today just to that. Yes. However, uh, this morning you have been doing some interesting things, <laughs> uh, not strictly related to your work or yes, anything. Yes. So, what did you do this morning? This morning, morning I did the uh, Publix Half Marathon. Half Marathon. They had a 5K, they had a half marathon, mm -hmm. and then they had a full marathon in downtown Atlanta, and I did the half marathon. Uh, is uh, this something you do once in a while? Yes, I'm uh, an, an avid runner. I love to run. I run uh, probably five or six times a week, and really? I, each time I do a race, then I take a, another 16 weeks, and I find another race, <laughs> and then I do another race. So, so it was good to, to have this here in Atlanta. It was nice. It was very yeah. nice. So did you have a good uh, a good? Uh, it was a good run? race. Yes. It was a good race. So I was not going very fast. I'd, I wanted to finish in around two hours. Mm -hmm and I got done in two hours and four minutes, which mm -hmm. is fine, which is, yeah. which is good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe you were tempted to continue <laughs> running. <laughs> you know, at nine miles, I was thinking that, you know, I feel so good today, and it's nice weather, so maybe I'll just cross the finish line and then uh, get back in with the full marathon crew and do the full marathon. <laughs> And I, that was at nine miles, but at 12 miles, I said, no, I think I'll just do the 13 and stop and go home and then save the marathon for another day. <laughs> but probably you also rem remember that you have to come here. Yes, so <laughs> <laughs> so if, it, it, if it were not for me, probably you'd Maybe, have to. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What, uh, what does it make for you, to you? Why do you do that? Uh, because I, with, you know, like... Uh, like uh, uh, practitioner and also uh, yeah. teaching. Uh, I suppose you have quite a busy life. It's yeah. not easy to, to put aside uh, time for running. You know, I, I've been running since I was in high school. Really? And uh, so I ran in high school, I ran in college, and when I went to medical school, I stopped running because it was so much, uh, yeah. it was so busy. And then I had kids and <laughs> I stopped running for a while, but then I came back to running, and I think it's important to have some sort of physical fitness uh, mm -hmm. on a daily basis. Yes. Uh, it helps you to relax. It helps you to have better sleep. Um, it helps with your weight. <laughs> it, uh, it also uh, keeps you focused on the things that are more important. Uh, so some sort of physical activity is very important. And actually, that's one of the things that we talk to pregnant patients about. Mm. Uh, there are many patients many pregnant patients who don't get out much. And some patients actually think that when they're pregnant, yeah. they should not do any exercise at all. That's not true. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we recommend that most pregnant patients, if they're not having any pregnancy complications, yes. uh, they can do at least 30 minutes of brisk walking a day, or they can go to a pool and do some laps in the pool. Uh, or they can, you know, if they're, uh, if they have kids, they can get on a treadmill and, and wa watch TV and, mm -hmm. and just make sure that they're staying active during the pregnancy. Uh, we find that patients who uh, are more active in pregnancy actually have a lower risk of things like diabetes and high blood pressure later on in pregnancy. So it's important for us as, as men, as, as people who are not pregnant, but also for pregnant patients as well. Actually, from time to time, we hear about athletes uh, who continue their athletic activities, I mean competitive yes. uh, athletic activities, 
quite late uh, into their pregnancy. That's true. Yeah. That's very true. That's incredible. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it is incredible. But uh, I, th yeah, I think it's interesting because the way God sets th things up, He wants us to uh, to use our bodies, mm -hmm. to use our minds, and to uh, do things that would kind of advance his kingdom. Uh, and so I think that's very important for pregnant patients as well. Returning to you, uh, <laughs> uh, what's going in your mind when you run? And it's, it's not short, it's <laughs> a one hour, two hours. If you, f if you run a full marathon, it's yeah, yeah. about four for some. That's correct. Qu quite a time. Mm -hmm. What's going on in your mind at it's that interesting. time? interesting. A lot of times I'm thinking about my pace, Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at how far I've gone. And when you're doing a marathon for, for the half marathon, you're f the first thing is, okay, how, how am I doing for the first mile? And that gives you an idea as to, okay, what am I going to do th for the rest of the mm -hmm. 12 miles? And then when you get to, say, five miles, you can look back and say, okay, how have I done? And you are then saying, is it going to be a good day mm -hmm. where I can pick up the pace? Or is it going to be a bad day? Is it, it does I, do I have a, uh, uh, like some calf pain or mm -hmm. knee pain? And so in th at that point, you may want to slow down. So you're thinking about what your pace has been and what your pace is going to be moving forward. Um, and then it's interesting because there are so many other people in a race like this, yeah. and people have signs out, and they're saying ah. they want to give you a high five. And <laughs> so it's, it's interesting to see uh -huh. just the other people who are interacting, some interacting. somehow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Not very much, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it happens. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Too much of a good thing exactly. become a exactly. nuisance. Or <laughs> but it's interesting. It's very, very interesting. Yeah. So most of the time uh, you're thinking, I mean, your thoughts are related to the race. It's related to the you, race. You yeah. cannot uh, be so detached to think on, you know, spiritual or <laughs> professional or things. Uh, I do find yeah. that when I'm running, yeah. and particularly because I've been running for some time and my speed has been getting faster with time, I just think that God is really wonderful in the way mm. that he allows us to progress uh, in terms of your physical fitness or even in reading the Bible. When you read the Bible and you learn something in the Bible, uh, you say, okay, well, that's interesting. Uh, and then you go back and you read it again. And now you've got more insight <laughs> into uh, the things on in the Bible itself. And so it's magnificent how God allows you to progress uh, in terms of physical fitness or in terms of the things that you do in your professional life or mm -hmm. even in Bible study. And so I think mm. about that sometimes. <laughs> so some of the barriers or uh, problems you may encounter, you, you mentioned pain. Mm -hmm. uh, what about uh, pulse? Sometimes the, the, the heart is so Speeding up too much, <laughs> <laughs> or you don't, you, you well, don't happen? Well, when I run, I have a, um, a heart rate monitor on my watch, yes. so I can see what my heart uh -huh, rate is. Uh -huh. And the important thing is, especially for training, is if you maintain your uh, heart rate at a low level when you are training, yes then you can bump up the heart rate much, much more when you're competing. Mm -hmm. So during training, you're going at a slower speed and you're monitoring your heart rate to make sure it's down low. Like, uh, so probably not for every person the same, so but what, it, what, like what a lot of people do is they take 180 minus your age. Uh -huh. So for me, I'm 53 years old and I take 180 and I bring it down. So One my working heart rate when I'm, run, when I'm training is yeah. about 127 beats mm -hmm. per minute. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I'm racing, yes. I can get up to 170, 180 beats per oh. minute. But during the training... You, yeah. Can you keep uh, that uh, for uh, such a long time? Yeah? Yeah, without uh, any... Without any problems. Mm -hmm. But the problem is 
many times people, uh, when they're training, their heart rate is moving too fast. Mm -hmm. And so if you are training and you've got a heart, high heart rate, then you get to the competition and then you can't maintain it that long. So uh, keeping it low during your training allows you to bump it up during a, an exam, during the, the test, during the, uh, uh, the race, and it goes better. I interviewed quite a number of people running marathons mm -hmm. or ultra marathons <laughs> or uh, all kinds of thing, things. But uh, there is one question I, I never asked any one mm -hmm. of them. How is uh, weather influencing? Uh, yeah, you know, because yeah. sometimes in hot <laughs> weather we find it difficult even to, 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 to stay, not doing anything yeah. but just to be. <laughs> uh, and the people runs, mar mar run marathons in the heat of the day. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> how, what's, how is, what is your experience? It's interesting because once you get out there and you're actually uh -huh. training, yes. it, when it's a hot day, you know that it's hot. Of course. But once you start running, uh -huh. it doesn't make it through. And really? the same thing when it's cold as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right now, I'm training in the morning, and so I actually have a headlamp mm -hmm. So because I start out when it's cold, sure. when it's dark, dark. outside. Yeah, yeah. And it's very, very cold sometimes. Yes. But after two or three miles, mm -hmm. your body has warmed up and mm -hmm. you don't really feel uh, the coldness as much. And so in the heat, uh, it's the same thing as well. If it were up to me, I'd rather run when it's cold mm -hmm. than when it's hot. Uh, because you can always get yourself uh, more active mm -hmm. when it's cold outside. But when it's hot, it's yeah. just... It's it's <laughs> you, you can't do unpleasant. anything <laughs> about it, yeah. Well, let's, uh, hopefully today we, we touch <laughs> the topic. <laughs> there are so many side yeah. issues no uh, problem, no arise, problem. yeah. You. yeah. So, in the history of humanity, of course, there are tragic times when uh, quite a number of pregnancies were lost, yes. miscarriages, and small children, infants and small children mm -hmm. would die before reaching the age of uh, no sustainability. And uh, fortunately, in most developed countries, this is history now. In many, I, I suppose, in many develop, developing Correct. countries, uh, this is still a, a, a problem. Uh, now, mothers and uh, newborns and small children get much more attention and uh, yes, medical science has been able to do fantastic things yes, in yes. this respect. Uh, but uh, we are not going to discuss mainly on uh, you know, fantastic uh, feats of you know, like prenatal yeah. surgeries sure, or sure, very, sure. very sophisticated things. Because w when that's the case, the doctors will see what mm -hmm. uh, they can do. But uh, this is very limited in numbers. Yeah. Most, for most uh, uh, pregnancies, um, the issues are different. Yes. Many families, when it comes to procreating, uh, they have a fear or uh, genetic problems. Correct. Uh, from your experience, what's, uh, as numbers are concerned, what's more important, uh, pregnancy uh, problems created by lifestyle disease, mm -hmm. chronic diseases, or the genetic uh, disorders? Yeah, so definitely I would say lifestyle. Lifestyle. Disorders. So unfortunately, they don't get proper attention. Correct. Everyone is scared by genetic problems, but not so uh, ris ris uh it's, it's very interesting because there are certain subsets of people who mm -hmm. have genetic disorders that run in the family. Yes. So if, it, if it's happened in other people in their family, then yes. they're at increased risk. Mm -hmm. That's a small subset of people. Yes. And then there are conditions that are related to the mother's age. Uh -huh. uh, so for example, patients who are at risk for Down syndrome, that risk gets higher as, as the mother the gets older. Mm -hmm. uh, and so obviously it's not a main concern for someone who's younger, uh -huh. and it becomes a more important issue as the mother gets older. 
And in the developed countries, uh, this is the trend. Correct. Clearly, to have children later in yeah. life. Yeah. yeah. So that's an issue. It is. Uh, but I would say that so many lifestyle issues, uh, which can be prevented yes. or which can be ameliorated, kind of decreased uh, in their scope, uh, are much more important uh, for pregnant patients. Let's speak first on, on genetic uh, issues. Uh, and then we reserve most of the time for issues related to lifestyle and chronic disease and things like that, yeah? Uh, so what are some of the, you, you mentioned already uh, age and uh, uh, Down syndrome mm -hmm. uh, uh, possibilities of uh, risks. What other genetic issues uh, should be known by, by future mothers? So as I said, um, mothers who, I'm sorry, Sorry about that. Uh, uh, let's uh, take over. Yeah, sir. So uh, I thought this was off. Uh -huh. Okay. So we'll uh, discuss. We'll keep the the best of. No. Let's speak first on genetic issues, so and uh, then hopefully we'll be able to spare enough time to discuss uh, chronic di diseases and uh, lifestyle issues related to pregnancy. So you mentioned already age of the mother mm -hmm. and uh, the risk of uh, Down yeah, syndrome. Sir. What other genetic issues should be known by potential mothers? Certainly. Uh, there is a condition called cystic fibrosis, uh, which is much more common in people who are um, from Northern Europe and uh, Eastern Europe. And in patients who have cystic fibrosis, uh, the baby develops uh, uh, fluid buildup inside the chest cavity. Uh -huh. uh, and so with cystic fibrosis, uh, that is a genetic disorder. What happens is if one parent and the other parent are both carriers, then there's a 25% chance that the baby will have the condition of cystic fibrosis. Uh, so that's one condition. Uh, another thing that we see in African Americans is sickle cell anemia. That's a condition where the baby gets a uh, abnormal form of hemoglobin. And so from peri during periods of time, uh, the baby will have either anemia or it will get uh, episodes of pain, what we call a sickle cell crisis, and they may need to go to the hospital, they may need a transfusion. So that's another uh, significant uh, genetic disorder that we see. Practically speaking, uh, some uh, people know, they know already that they have a condition which could have repercussions on the, on the health of the fetus. Some may not. Correct. Uh, when a family is thinking about uh, having a child, mm -hmm. should uh, they go, uh, every, every one of them who are not aware of sure. any problem, should uh, they go for a kind of genetic uh, testing or Correct. things like that? And so this is uh, something that they should discuss with their, their OBGYN. And after they do a uh, detailed history yes. of people in the family mm -hmm. and people that they don't know in the family, mm -hmm. they can uh, set up a screening for these genetic disorders. Uh, so something like sickle cell or cystic fibrosis or uh, other conditions uh, can be identified and see if the baby is at risk. Yes. Uh, and then those patients can have specific testing to see if the baby is at risk for those conditions as well. So it's a good chance with proper uh, a proper uh, a thorough discussion mm -hmm. with the doctor and uh, if needed uh, testing it's possible to detect most of, of the of the conditions a significant which number a, a yes. significant number yes yeah yeah uh, and in case uh, the tests are positive and they do have mm -hmm. problems uh, that means uh, they should uh, put an end to their plans or with proper care in some conditions they could be advised to, to go on and Absolutely. having a so yeah, yeah. Most of the conditions that we're talking about, 
if you have a prenatal diagnosis yes. or if you have an increased risk, yes. there are therapies that mm -hmm. can be started once the baby is born mm -hmm. uh, to avoid those complications really? or mm -hmm. to reduce the severity of those complications. And that's very significant because in the old days, we would wait for the baby to show signs or symptoms of mm -hmm. the condition. So something like cystic fibrosis or sickle cell anemia or a fragile X syndrome, which is a form of mental retardation, mm -hmm. uh, we would wait until the baby shows signs of those conditions. But if you have a prenatal diagnosis, uh, you can start therapies up front in the, in the early part of the pregnancy before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, is anything else you'd like to, to mention now about genetic issues? Or we could uh, move on to lifestyle? And we could move on. Like I said, uh, the, the, the main issue is the person should talk to their OBGYN, uh, take a significant history, and then determine if they are at risk for these conditions. And then there can be testing for the te uh, conditions depending on where the patient falls in the spectrum of disease. I see. Uh, now, um, speaking on, on life lifestyle, mm -hmm. uh, it's it's uh, that moment when the family uh, they begin thinking and uh, uh, but actually only what happens from that moment on mm -hmm. it's significant or the what uh, they used to do the sure. way they lived their lives previously to right. thinking or conceiving is also important absolutely absolutely so one of the things we talk about in patients what we do what we call preconception counseling yes. so even before uh, the mother becomes pregnant, there are some things that they can do uh, to avoid complications moving forward. Yes. Uh, the number one thing would be uh, drinking alcohol. Mm -hmm. uh, patients who are drinking alcohol should stop. Uh, and we know that that improves outcomes on the babies and in terms of pregnancy complications. Um, people who have a, a high meat diet uh, it is better for them to eat uh, more natural foods, uh, things that, let, that are over-processed, uh, things that have um, saturated fat in them uh, are not good for the pregnancy and for uh, the developing fetus. And so stopping those even before you become pregnant becomes an issue. Uh, people who have diabetes, mm -hmm. um, a lot of times patients who have diabetes, they may need medication to control their diabetes or uh, something like losing weight or more exercise, once again, before you become pregnant, improves pregnancy outcomes across the board. Uh, we, we spoke about exercise in the beginning, yes. but I'd like to, to take more time about uh, uh, that. In the past, uh, uh, most of the women were very active physically, mm -hmm. probably too much, yeah, too yeah. much, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, but now we are on the other side of the Correct. pendulum and Correct. most uh, people, not just women, uh, have too little exercise. Uh, in what ways is this uh, influencing the health of it the... It makes a significant difference mm -hmm. because, like you said, uh, over time, people don't walk around that much. You just get in a car and drive here and drive to work and, and come home late and... Uh, they're not doing physical activity. Uh, maybe they're sitting at a desk or maybe they're just doing customer service. And so they're not getting as much uh, activity yes. as they would in the mm -hmm. past. The other thing that uh, occurs, which is very important, is sleep. Mm -hmm. um, many, many people are not getting enough sleep. Uh, so we say that you should get at least seven to eight hours of sleep per night. Um, and sometimes that means turning off the TV and, mm -hmm. and going to bed early. <coughs> and sometimes it means waking up a little bit later if you can. Uh, but improving your sleep quality does, um, uh, uh, does uh, it improves pregnancy outcomes uh, substantially as well. So physical activity, sleep um, uh, is, is also important. Is it important for a future mother to be physically fit, to have a good uh, to mus muscular tone mm -hmm. and tonus and to, to, to be flexible, to be, to 
to, to be strong is is it important absolutely absolutely because uh, uh, pregnancy is quite demanding yes, and is. not to mention labor yes yes yeah. <coughs> so one of the things that i tell patients all the time is that if you are if you become pregnant your center of gravity is going to change change right? yeah, significantly yeah. so it's kind of like if you wanted to go to the gym and you wanted to lift 200 pounds. <laughs> you couldn't you do it, right? Yeah, sure. But if you went to the gym today and you did 20 pounds, and then the next day you did 30 pounds, and then you rested and did 40 pounds, mm -hmm. eventually you could lift much more than you would the first day you came sure. in. And so we tell the patients that that is the same kind of thing that your body needs mm -hmm. when your center of gravity is changing with the pregnancy. If you are more physically fit, uh, then the, uh, the aches and pains of pregnancy mm -hmm. are less uh, because your body is able to withstand the change in direction of the pregnancy. Uh, it is uh, normal, of course, for, for a pregnant woman to gain some weight yes. because uh, there are many transformations Correct. and in the la later part of the pregnancy, the, the fetus itself or himself uh, uh, grows, and uh, but uh, many many other things surrounding. Uh, but uh, it is uh, normal uh, that uh, I mean, but sometimes uh, pregnant women gain too much yes. weight, and uh, that also becomes a problem after birth. Absolutely. So is anything uh, to be done about uh, that or this is just part of just part of motherhood <laughs> <laughs> well it's very interesting that you should say that because there are problems if you gain too much weight or if you gain too little too weight little. Uh -huh. uh, so women who don't gain en enough weight during pregnancy particularly women who are already uh, who are thin uh -huh. and don't gain very much weight they are more likely to have a preterm delivery. Uh -huh. They're more likely to have a baby that is uh, what we call growth restricted, meaning a baby that's smaller at small term. Uh, and those babies are at increased risk for having prolonged hospital stays. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you ha have a young woman and she's slight of build, you want to make sure that she's not gaining too little weight. Mm -hmm. And then- what would, Excuse me, what would be the cause of oh, gaining too little? Inad inadequate uh, diet? Or inadequate uh, diet yeah, yeah. is what we see uh, quite often. Mm -hmm. um, they may be, they are too much uh, concerned for their figure. Yeah, and, uh, I, 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 I think that probably happens mm -hmm. from time to time. Uh, so we need to counsel these patients that uh, improving their weight gain will improve the pregnancy outcome across the board. On the other side? On the other side, patients who gain too much weight mm -hmm. are at risk for a number of problems as well. Uh, they are at risk for high blood pressure in pregnancy. They're at risk for gestational diabetes, which mm -hmm. where the, pregnant, the pe person does not have diabetes, but during the course of pregnancy, they develop diabetes. Mm -hmm. And that is much more common in patients who gain too much weight. Uh, they're more likely to have babies that are larger than expected and a baby that's too large may increase the risk of having a cesarean delivery. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll probably talk about the fact that uh, there are a number of complications that can occur when you have a cesarean delivery. Now, obviously, some patients need cesarean deliveries, sure. and it's, it's, it's life-saving, uh, but there are a subset of patients who gain too much weight, and it increases the risk of having a cesarean delivery. And so just by kind of controlling what they eat, uh, they can reduce that risk. So possible causes for uh, excessive uh, gain, uh, weight gain could be uh, improper, uh, uh, improper diet. diet yeah. Yeah. So uh, we talked about that it's better to eat fresh foods, foods that are not overly processed, mm -hmm. uh, foods that don't have too much fat in them. Uh, because one of the things we know is that for patients who have this excessive weight gain, it kind of filters down into all the other pregnancy complications. Mm -hmm. uh, and so a lot of times it's really because of 
uh, processed foods, things with too much sodium, uh, too much uh, glucose, too much sugar. Um, and those things, uh, they kind of increase weight, they increase fat, but they're not really doing much for the baby, the baby yeah, yeah. In, uh, while the mother is gaining all the they, extra weight. Uh, they may eat a lot, but not uh, enough of the nutrients the Correct. baby uh, really needs. Correct. Yeah. Uh, an excessive sodium salt mm -hmm. also leads to water retention, another source of, of, uh, of weight. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Sodium is a, is a problem because it causes water retention and it can cause uh, high blood pressure in pregnancy Both. as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I don't know about this culture, <laughs> honestly, but in my culture and probably in others, the cravings of the, yes, of the yes. pregnant women <laughs> are proverbial. Are they real yeah. or a myth? So uh, they are real. They are real. They are real. And there are certain types of cravings that are particularly seen in women who have underlying metabolic problems. So for example, uh, I know in Nigeria, maybe you've heard of it, where people have this uh, intense need to eat like clay mm. or like the ice shavings on the uh, refrigerator. Mm. <laughs> and a lot of times that happens because the woman is anemic. Mm -hmm. So if the woman is not, uh, if her blood count is low, she's gonna have these cravings. Mm -hmm. And so many times those can be screened for in terms of just looking at the blood count and some of the metabolic panels that the doctors can do. In my culture, it was also this idea that uh, if a pregnant woman has a craving for something she has to, <laughs> it will be very dangerous for her not to eat uh, <laughs> that. Uh, yeah. Is that true? <laughs> I, I don't think that's very true. <laughs> uh, like I said, sometimes cravings are specific to cultures, yes. and so th that's th not a problem. But what I'm concerned about is the cravings that have been s shown to be related to a metabolic problem. Sure. When, when this is not the case, yeah. do you have an advice for women who struggle with cravings, which are <laughs> not healthy? For, for things that are not healthy, mm -hmm. uh, I would first talk to the OBGYN uh -huh. and make sure that there's no, no underlying problem. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the other thing is, if it's something that is that you can do just a little, a little bit, bit. Mm -hmm. just to get the, the, the craving, yeah. mm -hmm. that, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But um, the main issue is it could be an underlying cause. Mm -hmm. and so we want to look at that as well. Yeah. You mentioned diabetes, mm -hmm. and uh, this is a major, yes. isu a major issue. Let's uh, give more detail on, on that. Uh, yes. So diabetes is a condition where there is an increased amount of uh, blood mm -hmm. sugar in the bloodstream. Now, generally speaking, the average pregnant patient is going to increase her blood sugar slightly to feed the baby, and so that's good. Mm -hmm. But in a certain subset of patients, about 10 to 15 percent of patients, the blood sugar is going to be even more than when what the baby needs. And so when the mother has this increase in blood sugar, that is when we make the diagnosis of gestational diabetes. And the problem with gestational diabetes is that mothers who have gestational diabetes are at increased risk for a number of pregnancy complications. For example, mothers who have diabetes are more likely to have babies that are too large. They're more likely to have a cesarean delivery. They're more likely to have what we call um, jaundice. When mm -hmm. the baby is born, the baby has yellow, uh, a yellow color. kind of pigment, and it's because of the diabetes itself. Uh, and in the worst case scenario, if the mother has diabetes and it's untreated for a long period of time, it has been shown to cause stillbirth. Oh. So the baby is living one day, it's doing well, and then she comes in for a visit the next day and the baby's no longer there. Mm -hmm. uh, baby doesn't have a heartbeat. So that has been associated with diabetes as well. Uh, so when we identify a patient who has gestational diabetes, we put them on a program to reduce the number of complications. So first, we put them on a diabetic diet. Now, it's not a weight loss diet, <coughs> but what it does is it balances out the amount of protein and carbohydrates in the food that they eat. <coughs> and so 
by balancing the protein and carbohydrates and taking away kind of the simple sugars, it reduces blood sugars. The other thing we do when uh, they have gestational diabetes is we have their check their finger sticks, uh, do a finger prick after meals, and make sure that it's within the normal range. So the average pregnant patient, if she were to just take her finger stick and she doesn't have diabetes, her blood sugar is going to be less than 120. Mm -hmm. all right? For the patient with diabetes, we want her blood sugar to be less than 120, or worst case scenario, less than 140. Mm -hmm. all right? uh, so if you can reduce that blood sugar burden, it reduces the risk of complications. Yes. The other thing is that we do ultrasounds from time to time. And the ultrasound al lets us look at the baby's amniotic fluid and the baby's heart rate and the baby's placenta to make sure that the baby is healthy as well. And then finally, for some patients uh, who have diabetes, we'll either put them on an exercise program or give them medication to reduce the blood sugar. Because anything we can do to reduce blood sugar is going to reduce the number of pregnancy complications. So if I hear you well, you wouldn't say that the woman uh, who is a diabetic uh, should uh, write off uh, the, the possibility of having a child. No, 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 no. not at all. Uh, there but are a number of patients who have diabetes th that it can be controlled yeah. and we can have good outcomes. But yeah, but they have to to be under medical control all the time and to respect, to follow the, the, the orders of the doctor to, to yeah, yeah, otherwise. It's a very dangerous very condition. Very it's dangerous. a very dangerous condition mm -hmm. for both the mother and the baby. So yeah, yeah. Uh, the main issue is controlling the diabetes. Yeah. What about uh, high blood pressure mm -hmm. in uh, pregnant uh, women? So high blood pressure is much more common the first time someone gets pregnant. Mm -hmm. uh, and people think it's because there is a, the baby is what the body thinks is as a formed yes. body. It has DNA from the father, DNA from the mother, and it's doing something that's interacting mm -hmm. uh, because it's a foreign body. Yes. So the first time a woman gets pregnant, she's at increased risk for high blood pressure. Uh, also, if a woman is heavier, she's more likely to have high blood pressure in pregnancy. And the third issue is if she has sisters or her mother with a history of high blood pressure, she's also at increased risk for high blood pressure in pregnancy. Uh, so what are the effects on the fetus of high blood pressure? So when the mother's blood pressure is high, that is there's increased resistance to blood flow to her organs. And it also decreases blood flow to the baby as well. Mm. So a mother with high blood pressure can have a small baby, all right? Uh, what we call fetal growth restriction. This so is fetal growth rest restriction. Correct. Yes. So that uh, happens much more commonly. The other issue is mothers with high blood pressure can have low amniotic fluid, all right? So the amniotic fluid that the baby floats yes. in mm -hmm. is supposed to be in a normal range, not too high not too low, but if you have high blood pressure for the mother and the baby's struggling to get its blood supply, uh, it's going to be smaller and it may have low amniotic fluid as well. Leading to? Uh, what, 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 why is uh, this dangerous? So low amniotic fluid has been associated with stillbirth. Mm -hmm. uh, low amniotic fluid is associated with a condition where the placenta prematurely separates from the wall of the uterus, what we call a abruption placenta. Uh, and so those are all complications related to high blood pressure. How could they control their blood pressure? Because uh, probably some medications usually used for, for that, probably, I don't know, mm -hmm. just asking, sure. uh, are not appropriate for the, for the yeah. fetus. So we always start with the non-medication uh, uh, clues first. So we talked about exercise. We talked about a low sodium diet. Mm -hmm. We talked about a uh, plant-based diet mm -hmm. as well as reducing your cholesterol level. All those things can reduce blood pressure. Uh, and so we start with that first and we want monitor the baby's, the mother's blood pressure. 
In some cases, we may need to put her on a medication that's shown to be safe in pregnancy. Mm -hmm. all right? mm -hmm. One of the things we'll do, that many doctors will do, is a, a collection of the urine for 24 hours mm -hmm. and then send that to the lab. And what we're looking for is the amount of protein in the 24-hour uh, urine. Mm -hmm. And that gives us an index as to whether or not the patient has the type of uh, blood pressure that is better with medication or better with uh, lifestyle changes. Interesting. Uh, I know you quite well, and uh, of course I fully resonate when you say uh, that you'd recommend to such a patient mm -hmm. a plant-based uh, diet. Mm -hmm. Is uh, that standard among your profession, or is mainly with you because you have a certain understanding? I think, I think a lot of doctors. A lot of doctors. A lot of I'm doctors very encouraged are, to hear are that. very, <laughs> very interested mm. in a plant-based diet. Really? There are a number of doctors, because they know that I, I'm I, a, a plant-based sure. physician myself, they come to me and <laughs> say, well, I'd, I've heard about a plant-based diet and that it improves pregnancy outcomes. And so they'd like to know what recipes I have. And so I, I usually send them to my wife. <laughs> she's, a, she's a great cook. But m many more doctors are uh, interested in a plant-based diet because when you look at pregnancy outcomes for these patients, they do much better. That's very interesting and very encouraging because I yeah. don't think that was the case uh, 25 years no, ago, not, or not even, even, <laughs> not ten even 10 years, years ago. 10 years, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, a new, a, it's a new, it's a new trend yeah. and yeah. Uh, very encouraging. I uh, hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really impressed with that, yeah. yeah. Because we Adventists, of course, we have promoted that for mm -hmm. more, than ha uh, more than a century. Absolutely. But we, we used to, to feel like we are <laughs> the only voice in the, in the d <laughs> you know, well, like wilderness. I, said, but I no. think there are a number <laughs> of doctors now that mm. have shown in research uh, that it does improve pregnancy outcomes. And so now even a lot of doctors who are not Seventh-day Adventists uh, have looked at the research and say, wow, I, I would like to try this for my patients. That's, that's really encouraging. Uh, <coughs> we speak about the, the woman, we speak about future mother, pregnant woman, and so on. All we are speaking here about is the duty and the responsibility <laughs> of the woman, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the husband or uh, the father <laughs> has nothing to do with all of that. <laughs> so if something goes wrong, the woman only is going to be blamed for that. <laughs> it's interesting that you should say that because I think that there is a role for fathers. Uh, a lot of times, uh, if you are in a, in a uh, relationship and you're putting the person that's pregnant under more stress, either because of the way you talk to them or uh, if you're uh, abusing them or castigating them or if you are talking down to them and they're getting more stress, that's going to have effect on not only the pregnant person but on the, page, the, uh, the fetus as well. And so we are looking for uh, fathers to have a kind of um, a pleasant relationship so that it improves pregnancy outcomes for everyone. So I think it, uh, uh, there's something to do for mm. fathers as well. Yeah. So it's uh, their role to, to support, yes. to help, uh, to be an emotional uh, source of Safety and uh, Absolutely. happiness. Absolutely. Uh, so the the emotional uh, condition of the mother, of future mother, mm -hmm. uh, is that proven to have an impact on the health of the baby, or this is just uh, you know philosophical thinking, <laughs> medically speaking, is that proven? So I would say that there is a role. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the extremes, mm -hmm. and if you look at studies, so women who are in monogamous relationships where they're happy with their spouse, uh, they have better outcomes mm -hmm. than women on the other end of the spectrum. People who are either uh, have been abandoned or are incarcerated or mm. are not uh, having a, uh, a fruitful relationship with the people around them those people have worse pregnancy outcomes. 
Uh, and so that, that's shown in, in the, uh, the research as well. So um, I anything we can do to improve uh, the outlook for a pregnant patient is going to improve the outcome for the pregnancy itself. Yeah. Um, are there uh, other medical specialists uh, involved in uh, taking care of the pregnant woman and the fetus, or is it just the uh, gym? So there are a number of different mm -hmm. specialties that deal with uh, pregnant patients. Mm -hmm. So the, prim the uh, primary specialty is the OBGYN. And he's going to do prenatal care, he's going to do screening for many of the medical conditions. And then if the patient has a medical problem, she'll be sent to a maternal fetal medicine specialist like myself, mm -hmm. also called a perinatologist. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we will kind of deal with if there's a genetic disorder or if we need a prenatal diagnosis or if there is uh, a medical problem that needs to be taken care of that the OBGYN is not uh, comfortable with. It's interesting you should mention that when you started off, how there are conditions where the babies used to die in utero. Uh, there are conditions where the baby used to die when it was born as well. One of the things we do in our office, mm -hmm. and that uh, I think a lot of uh, specialists are doing, is diagnosing heart defects in the baby. Yeah. Um, my wife had a brother who had a condition called Tetralogy of Fallot. Now this was in Nigeria, they didn't know about that condition. Mm. They just knew that the baby would turn blue from time to time and they'd take him to the hospital and they'd give, give him oxygen. oxygen yeah. and he, he, he eventually died. Mm. But as now, a baby? As a, as a baby. Mm. Uh, but now we can identify uh, babies with Tetralogy of Fallot before, before, before they're birth. born. Mm -hmm. And then we can do surgery after the baby's born. Uh, so uh, that's one of the things that we do. Um, so that requires our office as well as a pediatric cardiologist to take so care of Sometimes uh, it takes a team yes. to take care of the special needs of a, of a pregnant woman in the Correct. fetus. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. What does, are some of the cutting edge uh, issues uh, or uh, technologies or uh, wh what do you expect uh, <laughs> you know, in the next few years to, sure, sure. to improve the chances for difficult pregnancies? There are a number of things that are coming out right mm -hmm. now. So we talked about the amniocentesis mm -hmm. for prenatal diagnosis. Mm -hmm. There are also conditions where the baby in utero is noted to have anemia. Mm. And so if the baby has anemia, we can see that when we do the ultrasound in terms of blood flow in the middle cerebral artery. Now in the old days, there was nothing that could be done mm. about a baby that was anemic in utero. Mm -hmm. uh, but now we are actually doing what we call uh, PUBS, percutaneous umbilical blood sampling, mm. and then blood transfusion in utero. Really? Yeah, so we do that now. Mm. Uh, so if we identify that the baby is anemic and she's pregnant and mm -hmm. she's still long way from term, mm -hmm. uh, we'll do a PUBS and then we'll do a fetal transfusion and then up the baby's blood count and then deliver the baby and treat what the anemia was. So that's the other thing that we do now. Uh, in Georgia, we now have doctors who are doing uh, fetal surgery for spina bifida. Mm. So a baby that is born with spina bifida will have a defect in the spine. And if you don't treat it, uh, the baby is going to be paralyzed from the point of the spinal defect below. Now what we can do is if we identify a baby that has spina bifida, there are surgeons that can actually do surgery while the mother is still pregnant, cover the, uh, the defect in the spine, and then once the baby's born, then they can do surgery For afterwards. The surgery. Mm -hmm. And so that improves outcome because mm -hmm. in the old days, uh, if the baby was just exposed to the amniotic fluid, it damages the nerves. <coughs> 
and then once the baby's born, you can't uh, correct it. Mm -hmm. But if you do surgery now, uh, in utero, then you do surgery afterwards, the babies do have mm -hmm. uh, normal functioning. Uh, very very impressive, be. yeah. Um, for some, uh, uh, for some women, there is the danger of a premature birth. Yes. Uh, why and what can be done? Yeah. So, premature birth is what we call multifactorial, which means it comes from a number of different causes. Uh, it could be because of her diet. It could be because she has a history of a hist of preterm delivery. It could be uh, because she has this placental abruption, which we see in mm -hmm. high blood pressure. Uh, it could be because uh, she is under some sort of stress from another underlying condition. So for preterm birth, the first thing we do is identify, if we can, what the underlying cause is and then treat the underlying cause. So if it's high blood pressure, treat the high blood pressure. If it's gestational diabetes, treat that as well. Um, in other cases, uh, we do medications to try and prolong the pregnancy. Uh, some of the medications we use right now are something called progesterone. Mm -hmm. Progesterone is a normal pregnancy hormone, mm -hmm. but people uh, who have preterm birth have a lower mm -hmm. level of mm -hmm. progesterone. So we can give that either as an injection, as a suppository, or by mouth, and in some cases that can prolong pregnancy as well. Um, uh, the other thing is sometimes patients who have had miscarriages in the second trimester. And so we do what we call a cerclage, mm -hmm. which is called a stitch that we place into the cervix that keeps the cervix closed, closed and allows the pregnancy to go from the second trimester into the third trimester to reduce the risk of preterm labor. So we do that as well. Uh, twin pregnancies or tri triple pregnancies, <laughs> do they need special care? Yes, they do. Usually, usually. They do. Uh, mm -hmm. So the first thing is to identify what type of mm -hmm. uh, twins they are. The best case scenario is patients who have fraternal twins. So what it happens is that two eggs are uh, uh, implanted by two sperms, and those are fraternal twins. Yes. Totally, right? different. totally different. Mm. Uh, on the other side of the spectrum is identical twins. Now those patients, those babies can sometimes share the same placenta, mm -hmm. they can be in the same sac, mm -hmm. or even rarely they can be conjoined mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. And that's a much more high risk sure. pregnancy. Sure. Uh, but any multiple pregnancies, whether it's twins or triplets or quadruplets, should have an ongoing uh, care, not only with the OBGYN, but with a maternal fetal medicine specialist. Hopefully the pregnancy went to the normal time and the birth was done properly and the baby is uh, uh, healthy. Uh, <coughs> are there some, uh, some things uh, a future mother uh, would be advised to do in the last part of the pregnancy as a preparation for the post-pregnancy <laughs> period? <laughs> Because mo usually most of the, uh, of the focus is on yeah, uh, pregnancy yeah. and the birth. But <laughs> after that? <laughs> well, you know, there are so many things that ha come into play mm -hmm. at the end of the pregnancy. Um, one of the things we talk about, particularly in the third trimester, is the fact that some women will get uh, postpartum blues mm -hmm. or depression, depression after yeah. pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of uh, effort can, can improve that just by identifying that the patient is at risk for that. Is, is there a possibility to, 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 to know that ahead of time? Sometimes, sometimes yes, sometimes, sometimes, sometimes no. Mm -hmm. uh, if you know that someone is having difficulties mm -hmm. during pregnancy, it's you it's may want to mm -hmm. have her speak to someone mm -hmm. um, to address those things yes, up front. Yes. Uh, so you are a doctor, but y y you are at the same a person of faith, yes. uh, working with uh, so many pregnant women. In what ways uh, did uh, this shape 
in your understanding of human human nature uh, did it feed your admiration or your pessimism about uh, human nature human race and uh, another question the last one probably in what ways working uh, relating to to pregnant women and you know influenced your understanding of God. Yes, yes. So I would start with that question first. Mm -hmm. I think when you look at pregnant patients and the things that we we're able to do for them and the outcomes that we have, uh, particularly in patients that would have otherwise had uh, unfortunate outcomes, I can only say that God is a merciful God. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the fact that we are able to do these things is just a, uh, a manifestation of his grace mm -hmm. uh, to us as physicians and to the people that we take care of. Uh, so it had strengthened my belief uh, that we serve a, a, a God. Um, just me and other related yes. questions, maybe but the time is too short for that. Sure. Uh, <coughs> seeing the complexity Incredible, compl I mean, uh, even mm -hmm. the most advanced scientists probably don't know everything yes, of <laughs> about what's yes, going on. Yes, yes. Uh, is uh, this a factor, building up your faith in God as creator? Yeah, so yes, mm -hmm. there are so many things that we know, but there's so many things we still do not know. And they are, there are things that happen in this world that can't be explained mm. uh, by science. Mm. Uh, otherwise, we'd have all normal pregnancies across the board. Uh, so it does also give me um, pause to know uh, that even though we serve a, a, a wonderful God, uh, that this is not all that we have in this world, mm -hmm. uh, that we have something better uh, mm. that's coming uh, when Jesus comes back. Mm -hmm. And uh, the previous question was about uh, uh, are you, do, do you have more hope or you are more pessimistic <laughs> <laughs> about human nature, human race? Well, I, I, I tend to be uh, an optimist. So I, I tend to, to look to for the best, but um, that also comes back to my grounding in, in the church as well. Uh, I think things will go get better because Jesus is coming back soon. Yeah, speaking on the, on the life, the future life, uh, Isaiah gives some very, very interesting uh, uh, pictures and small children are always involved. Yes, uh, yes. In one place it says there will be no more children to die young. Yes, yes. In another place, um, I, th I think it's Isaiah 10 or 11, it says, it, it describes small children playing uh, uh, without any fear yes, yes. with uh, very dangerous yes, animals yes, yes, and in yes, uh, yes. another place a small child child uh, uh, leading uh, uh, a lion <laughs> and uh, an ox and yes, you know yes. i mean animals much bigger it's than beautiful. themselves and, uh, but everything is so harmonious so peaceful so harmless so it's interesting uh, that small children are always <laughs> part of the description of the new world. Yes. We don't know exactly how it will be, but one thing for sure, there will be no harm. Amen. Mm. Amen. So your, your profession will be out of, out of uh, I'll be happy. market. I'll <laughs> find something else to do, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I wish you many, many happy experiences uh, taking care of mothers and uh, their children. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.